we are live in four, three, and we are live. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session Data Crunching with R in USAR 2022. And I am honored to be the chair of this session. Uh, we have four great speakers today with very interesting topics. I see 16 people in the audience. We might have more, but please feel free to ask questions uh, in the QA tab. There is a QA tab, so you can add your questions there. And we will do our best to have uh, some time between the talks to, uh, for, so that speakers can answer your questions. Otherwise, if any questions are left, our speakers will uh, answer them uh, after the session is concluded. And without further ado, I want to announce our first speaker, uh, Patrice Godard, with Managing and Leveraging Knowledge Catalogs with TKCAT. Hopefully I pronounced it correctly. And Patrice, please share your screen. Yep. I'm sharing. Can you see it? Yep, I can see it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Edgar. So uh, my name is Patrice Godard. I'm a biochemist by training, uh, but I turned to bioinformatics during my PhD thesis. I have worked uh, in the biotech and biopharmaceutical industry for 12 years, and my main area of expertise is in omics data analysis. Today, I'm going to present you the TikiCAD package, which has been developed to manage and leverage in R, knowledge that has been extracted from external resources or generated from internal research projects. And to the same, I will discuss specific examples related to the role and the activities of my team within the UCB company. So UCB is a biopharmaceutical biopharm company focused on creating value for people living with severe diseases, mainly in immunology and neurology. In this context, the translational bioinformatics team participates in three main research missions. The, the first one is about getting a better understanding of disease mechanisms and how they can be experimentally studied. The second mission is to identify new relevant therapeutic approaches. And the third mission is to identify therapeutic opportunities in patient populations. The example I will show today are related to these activities, but the TikiCAD package is also applicable to many other knowledge areas. Now, Let's clarify what I mean by knowledge. Using this image, I have seen floating around in social networks. It depicts quite well, among other things, the different kinds of assets used or produced in the frame of data analysis projects. On one hand, original data is often the output of devices, such as an image, a signal, or a DNA sequence. Information is interpreted data, such as a genetic variant observed in an individual compared to a reference, or the level of expression of one gene in one sample. And knowledge can be seen as consistent information which has been combined with relationships identified between the different elements. On the other hand, insights uh, correspond to key elements of the knowledge which are of particular importance in a given context. For example, the understanding of a molecular mechanism involved in a condition of interest. And finally, wisdom can be seen as a relevant path for leveraging knowledge insights, such as the identification of a new therapeutic approach targeting a relevant molecular pathway. Unfortunately, uh, wisdom uh, is not a given, whatever the quality, the quality of the upstream assets. And we need to be careful not to take our fantasy uh, for it. Anyway, in this presentation, I'm not going to address this point, and I will focus wisely on the knowledge itself, how it can be structured, documented, and efficiently leveraged. More precisely, uh, what are the expected features of the knowledge we propose to manage with TikiCat? First, we deal with many different concepts. In our case, it can be disease, phenotypes, genes, uh, molecular pathways, protein abundance, and so on. And these concepts are related to each other in a way which highly depends on the context. That's why documenting the knowledge with a data model is, uh, very, valuable, uh, is very valuable, and uh, the Redamor package uh, is dedicated uh, to this task. We also make uh, the hypothesis that uh, most of the data underlying the knowledge can be organized in tables or in matrices. 
We want to use them in R, of course, but we also want them to be accessible and reusable uh, in other environments as much as possible. That's why uh, structured uh, folders and text files have been chosen to archive the knowledge and also as one solution to exchange it, especially with external collaborators. Developing a system integrating all pieces of knowledge is a very difficult task and highly risky. That's why we prefer to keep the different pieces of knowledge independent, but still ready for integration. Indeed, the different pieces of knowledge often refer to similar concepts, like gene uh, or disease in our case, and those concepts uh, can be used to build bridges across information areas. But these concepts are also often implemented using uh, different scopes and references. For example, some of the resources we manipulate refer to proteins, whereas others refer to their coding genes. That's why we have developed dictionaries of concepts, which are used to combine and integrate information when needed. BED focuses on biological entities, such as genes and proteins, whereas DODO focuses on conditions like disease and phenotype. Data supporting the knowledge can be quite large, depending on the scope. And we want, depending on the concept, context, sorry, either to use the corresponding tables as a wall or by subset. Also, the knowledge information is not supposed to be updated uh, very frequently, but it can still be valuable to keep track of the different versions uh, of this knowledge, which by nature tends to, uh, to evolve. Finally, uh, some data are more sensitive than the others or, comes, uh, or come with a license restriction, uh, which can uh, limit their use to a set of users. All these different features uh, led to the choice of the ClickHouse database management system for spreading the knowledge internally. Now, I would like to spend time uh, on a key and central type of object in TikiCat called MDB. MDB stands for Modeled Database, and it is used to organize a specific knowledge resource relying on the following organization. First, an MDB gathers the data themselves, which can be tables or matrices. Those data are documented by a data model produced using Redamor. General information or metadata are also added uh, to the project. They provide a title, a short description, and, and some references. Finally, some tables are annotated as collection members. It means that those tables refer to key concepts that can be used to build bridges across different knowledge resources. TikiCat supports different, uh, uh, different implementations of MDB, which differ in the way uh, data are made accessible, either in memory, in files, or uh, in the ClickHouse DBMS. Finally, TikiCat stands for a tailored knowledge catalog. And indeed, it's an R package providing a set of tools for managing and using knowledge resources made available uh, in MDBs. Now, uh, I'm going to exemplify how to build and manipulate uh, MDB. For that purpose, I'm going to use uh, some data made available within the Redamor package. For this simple example, I'm going to use three tables describing the phenotypes associated to different human diseases. This information comes from the Human Phenotype Ontology Project, or HPO. Uh, as a reminder, a phenotype is in, uh, an individual's uh, observa uh, observable trait, such as age, eye color, or blood type. For example, the occurrence of seizures is a strong phenotype of patients suffering of epilepsy. Using the Red Amor package, we can draft a very simple model of these three tables. Each rectangle represents uh, a table and the bullet points, the fields uh, in each of them. So far, except the data type, there is no constraint associated to the fields and no relationship identified between the tables. To add such information, we can use the model relational data function, which will launch a graphical user interface developed for creating and manipulating relational data models. In this case, for example, we have made all the fields of, of, of all the table non-nullable except the description uh, field of the HP table, which remain between brackets in this uh, uh, graphical representation. The fields in bold correspond to primary keys of the tables. We have also changed uh, the type of a few fields and added relevant relationships between the, the tables. To summary, the phenotypes are described uh, in the uh, HP table, uh, the diseases are described in the diseases table, and the disease HP table correspond to an association table between a disease and HP uh, and the phenotype, sorry, 
uh, each disease uh, presenting potentially several phenotypes and each phenotype present, uh, being presented by uh, potentially several diseases uh, as uh, indicated by the cardinality of uh, the relationship. Once the data model is created, it can be confronted to the data using the confront data function. This function returns a report that helps to uh, efficiently correct the data or the model when needed. The confrontation of the data model to the data also occurs when creating an MDB, which is achieved as, as shown on the left. The process of creation of an MDB follows the main features of this type of object I have uh, described before. It takes the data tables, the data model, and some general information. The content of, a, of an MDB can then be easily explored and retrieved, uh, as exemplified on the right. Intuitively, uh, the DB info uh, function returns general information, and the data model functions returns uh, the data model. The select function is used to focus the MDB on a few tables, and the pull function to extract a specific table. More interestingly, uh, the data model can be used to filter the data transitively through all tables. On the right, you have the original data model of the MDB we have just constructed, and on the left, you have the number of rows in each table. The aim of the highlighted command is to filter the HP table to keep rows uh, with the word I found in the description field. The idea is to get all phenotypes regarding the eyes. So after applying this, fit, this filter, uh, the data model did not change. However, on the bottom left, you can see that the number of rows of the HP table decreased, but also the number of rows of the two other tables, which were, uh, which were uh, filtered accordingly. The data model uh, can also, uh, also be used to automatically join uh, tables of interest. For example, after having focused the HPO MDB on eyes related phenotypes, it can be useful to put diseases directly in front of their corresponding phenotypes. This is achieved uh, by the highlighted command. This command alters uh, the data model as shown at the bottom right while keeping all the records, as you can see uh, at uh, the bottom left. As mentioned before, the TikiCAD package supports three main implementations of MDBs that can be easily interconverted. Each implementation uh, presents features that make it more or less relevant for different usages. In MIMO MDB, all the data are loaded in memory, so it makes data manipulation fast but greedy. It is convenient when the data are small or when we need to work with uh, wall tables. In file MDB, the data remain uh, in text files uh, until requested. It saves memory and allows to load only a few tables of interest. Um, however, uh, it makes uh, the data filtering quite slow. The main purpose of the file MDB is to archive the MDB and to share it with uh, external collaborators. Finally, in CHMDB, the data are stored uh, in a ClickHouse database. It's very uh, efficient to load the whole tables when needed, but also to get only uh, records of, of interest by sending SQL queries. Moreover, a mechanism has been implemented, implemented for managing access rights and supporting the versioning of the CHMDB. The main purpose of CHMDB is to provide an easy and flexible access to the data uh, which is quite convenient for sharing them uh, internally. Multiple CHMDB, CHMDB can be stored in the same ClickOS uh, instance, providing therefore a standard access to many knowledge uh, resources. And they can be accessed via a CHTKCAT object, which is a special connector to ClickOS. The ExploreMDBs function opens uh, a shiny user interface which can be used to browse uh, available knowledge resources. When a resource is selected, its data model can be explored and tables can be previewed and potentially downloaded. This, this application can also be deployed uh, to improve the awareness of available resources within a community. Collections are a powerful, a powerful mechanism to merge different knowledge uh, resources based on shared uh, concepts. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to describe this mechanism today. Uh, you can find more information about it in the documentation. 
uh, quickly. Uh, here you can see the results of uh, merging uh, two uh, MDBs, uh, which share uh, con the, the concept of, of uh, diseases. So thanks uh, to the Dodo uh, dictionary, an association table uh, in yellow has been uh, automatically created between the tables uh, providing uh, disease references. So this one and this one. I would like to finish with a comment regarding supported data types in Redamore and TikiCat. Currently, the following canonical R types are supported. In addition, uh, TikiCat allows the storing of files in MDB uh, using uh, Base64 encoding. Finally, uh, matrices and uh, sparse matrices are also supported by TikiCat. In the data model, they are represented as tables with three fields, one for row names, one for column names, and one for the values. Obviously, uh, Redamore and TikiCat packages were developed relying on existing tools. Uh, I wanted to highlight here those of particular importance for the success of this project. However, it's not an exhaustive list that you can eventually find on the CRAN, of course, or, or uh, on GitHub repositories. I would also like uh, to take this opportunity to thank the CRAN team for their efficiency in the publication of those R packages. To conclude, I would like to thank people uh, from my team at UCB uh, who have supported this project at uh, different levels. Thanks uh, to the organizers uh, of the user uh, conference who gave me the opportunity to present this work. And thank you all uh, for the attention you gave uh, to this presentation. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me uh, if you have uh, any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrice. This was very great. And uh, to the audience, please, if you have any questions, there is a QA tab. Please type your questions there, and uh, Patrice and our other speakers will have a chance to answer them. Uh, currently, I don't see any, any uh, questions. And I guess we can save this time towards the end if you guys want to add now. Thank you, Patrice, again. And uh, our Thank next you. speaker. Yep, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Patrice. Our next speaker is uh, Miguel Alvarez with database list against the metrics, use of text list and VEG table for the assessment of vegetation plot data. Miguel, please share your screen and floor is, it, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I should allow, oh. Oh, sorry, having desktop. The, the, sh the share button, yeah, I can share. Yes, um, hmm. this, um, uh, remember this decision allow, um, having issues with the, um, so uh, you, you cannot see my screen now. This screen? No, no. Okay. We can see you, but not the screen. Okay. Sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry for that. It's, it's not working. <laughs> Uh, because we can do this. I guess you can share, send your slides me via email, and then we can bump up uh, Robin as the next speaker. No worries at all. Okay, and then I can share your my screen, and then you can talk over it. Maybe do you, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. No worries. No worries. Uh, yeah. Just send me over email. And can we hear? We can hear you. You can see me. Okay. So uh, with this, no, no problem. With this, I want to introduce Robin Gower uh, with linked data frames. So Robin, please share your screen. Hello. My name is Robin, Robin Gower. 
a dream of the day when data scientists can focus on analysis instead of spending their time preparing data. I work as a freelance data designer with 15 years of experience consulting and as an economist. And, and I've been using R since about 2008. Okay, the presentation. The user audience will be familiar with tidy data, the way we melt or unpivot cross tabulations into long tables of observations to better work with the data. Instead of communicating dimensions with the structure and layout of the table, we turn them into data, columns in a data frame that can be addressed and manipulated. I work with data cubes expressed as tidy data. We have a central fact table and each column uh, is a dimension or a measurement and the values referenced in the dimensions are in turn described with dimension tables. The data is normalized, which means that it's structured to minimize redundancy by removing functional dependencies between rows and columns, making the independent pieces distinct and their relations clear. In this case, each dimension value occurs, uh, may occur many times in the long fact table. Uh, and just to fit all this on the screen, these have all been truncated, but you can imagine them getting longer and longer. Um, this type of normalized form is also known as a star schema because the large central fact table is surrounded by smaller ones like the diffraction spikes shining around a star. As analysts, we want to access all of this information, not just the central fact table. There's useful reference data stored in the dimension tables, like labels or codes or relations that describe a hierarchy between the resources or for richer resource types like geographies, we might have boundary polygons. So how do we work with data like this in data frames? It's possible to work with all of these types all of these tables separately, joining them each on the fly, um, your analytical pipeline. This can be quite repetitive. And so people tend to denormalize the data, realizing the result of all the joins in a giant single table. The, um, this it's is not normalized since there are dependencies between your columns. You can see the, the three year columns here, the three area columns here and so forth. And that means that you have to coordinate changes because they all belong together. We tend to avoid doing this in the source database because it requires more application code to maintain data integrity. It's more acceptable for analysis where the data doesn't change, but it makes tables harder to understand. People have to resort to data exploration to uncover the relationships between the columns. Arguably, the denormalized data is still tidy particularly if the fact table has a one-to-many join with the dimension tables because the join adds columns but not rows. Less unwieldy and it doesn't scale well. It quickly gets very wide, making it harder to inspect the data, which discourages people from adding too many columns. We also lose information about which columns belong together. And here, pandas in Python scores a point that you can relate variables by using tuples for column headers. Or as an R, we'd need to resort to string munging. Perhaps the worst problem, though, is that we introduce a lot of duplication, making um, data frames much bigger than they need to be. If you repeat a geographic boundary a couple of hundred times, you'll soon notice that the memory requirements shoot up and processing speed slows down. I'd like to propose an alternative solution which I've implemented with the help of the vectors library. We can use this to store the reference table as an attribute of a dimension vector and use the values to look up resource descriptions. I've released this as uh, the linked data frames package. Vectors is a developer focused package. You don't need to know about it to use the linked data frames package, but I'd like to take a moment to draw your attention to it as vectors is what is doing all the hard work here. Among other things, you can use vectors to create new vector types in R much more easily than using S3 directly. We don't have time to get into the details of uh, how this works, but the vectors vignette on S3 vectors 
is truly first-rate documentation. Uh, and it inspired me to, to sort of take a documentation-led uh, approach here. I will, um, however, explain a few of the gotchas toward the end of the talk that showcase where the abstraction leaks and uh, some care is needed to avoid subtle bugs. Before we get stuck into the code, though, I'd like to take a step back and provide some more context. I work with linked data. This is the, uses the resource description framework, which expresses information about resources using a knowledge graph. Resources in the graph are described with triples, relating a subject node with a predicate edge to an object node. Here in the center, we see Bob, the subject who's interested in the predicate, the Mona Lisa, the object. In linked data, all of the nodes and edges are uniform resource identifiers. That means you can look them up on the web and get back a definition. The object nodes can also be literal data types like strings and numbers. We can serialize these triples into a format like turtle. This groups blocks of statements with each predicate object pair in the description separated by a semicolon and terminated with a period. Namespace prefixes help make URIs legible. So this is actually a big long URI from um, schema.org, which is the vocabulary built by all the main search engines. And we can, rather than spelling out a massive URI each time, just have this um, uh, prefix notation. Um, we're using five different uh, vocabularies here that help define terms um, for us to use, URIs that we can use. You can think of these triples as a further form of normalization. We melt the tidy data down into statements relating the observation row with a column variable to the cell value. And we can do the same thing with the reference data. In my work with a company called Swirl, we published billions of these triples describing hundreds of data cubes and millions of reference resources. This contributes to the linked open data cloud, which connects data sets across many disciplines. In particular, our work on the integrated data program, which is an initiative from the UK's Office for National Statistics and other government departments, has focused on disseminating tidy data cubes. And it's this work that motivated the creation of the linked data frames package to help our users download tables of resources from the knowledge graph and assemble it into idiomatic data frames in R. Let's explore that idiomatic representation from the ground up. We'll start at the beginning and see how we can use the linked data frames package to create vectors of richly described resources. We'll start with a vector, or indeed we, we do start uh, with a vector of URIs that identify each resource. We record the descriptions in a data frame that must at least include a variable called URI that will be used to find the corresponding description of each resource. We create LDF resources and the vector of identifiers um, and the uh, data frame of descriptions. You can include a variable, uh, or rather if you include a variable called label in the description, this will be used by the format generic when printing to the console. We also print out a list of the variables present in the description. Because we're identifying resources with URIs and not by an ordinal index, you can include repetitions in the URI vector without needing to duplicate descriptions. We can treat the rich multidimensional description as a scalar value. We can use a URI to stand in for the object while its description is stored elsewhere orthogonally. Link data frames package provides accesses for the identifiers and descriptions. You can also select individual properties. Since labels are so ubiquitous, we have a dedicated accessor for them. Now we can look at how to load uh, in some existing data from the linked open data cloud. We'll start by learning about Sparkle, a query language for linked data, and then we'll see how to use LDF to write Sparkle queries for us. Finally, we'll look at how this approach generalizes to work with, with relational data too. The triples we saw earlier can be kept in databases called triple stores, and we can query triple stores with the Sparkle query language. This matches triple patterns. Here we're finding the first 100 um, resources of type uh, music genre um, that also have a label and a comment. 
And the variables here, um, starting with a, a question mark, are bound to the matching values in the results table, as you can see at the bottom. We can use this table to create LDF resources and then reach into the description um, while grepping genre to match against the comment, um, which lets us find dance music genres. You'll need a fair bit of domain knowledge to write Sparkle queries, both in terms of Sparkle itself, as well as the vocabularies that are used in the data. And the LDF package seeks to take care of this problem by writing the queries for you. LDF provides a set of functions for assembling linked data frames from data sets published according to the RDF data cube standard. This is mostly, mostly captured under the top level porcelain get cube, which builds on top of plumbing to orchestrate a set of Sparkle queries. These queries first download a tidy table of URIs for the observations, and then for each column, descriptions are downloaded for all of the reference data. And the results are assembled into a linked data frame. Hidden behind each of these LDF resource column types is one of the related tables we saw from in the star schema at the beginning. Now we can apply the full power of R to our linked data frame. Here we're using dplyr to filter, group, and aggregate the data. And the filter reaches in to the sector column to find the parent sector, which in turn is also a resource with a label, which we can match against a string. Notice that the groups are uh, uh, the group I also returns the original resource areas, which uh, carry the descriptions through for further analysis. As we saw earlier, um, those descriptions include well-known text or wicket boundaries provided by the ONS geography linked data endpoint. We can use these to draw a map. This example does require us to denormalize the data, um, our nested tabular uh, structure because simple feet the simple features package that I'm using for mapping here uh, expects the geometries and values to be in one data frame so we need to take the area description and then attach the measure to that before charting this is a nice demonstration of how the knowledge graph approach allows publishers to attach arbitrary information uh, to describe resources in their data sets Data consumers can then enjoy richly described data, which reduces the amount of preparation and enrichment that we have to do ourselves. Indeed, from here, we could also use the URIs to link this data to other data sets, uh, letting links in the knowledge graph tell us how the data fits together. Although the Sparkle example and the GetCube uh, wrapper are extracting linked data from a graph, we're still working with tabular data to create these resource descriptions. Indeed, we can use this approach to create resources with relational data. Uh, we can demonstrate how this works on the relational database using the New York City flights data set. We take the central flights table and then we replace the foreign keys with related objects themselves, with, with the objects themselves. That is to say, um, linked data frame resources described using the related tables. And note that I've had to invoke the fill missing flag here as the descriptions in the NYC flights package are incomplete. So now we have a single data frame containing all the reference data wired up correctly. And this makes it easy to work with this data uh, using dplyr and ggplot. The vectors package is an ambitious attempt to overhaul some of the inner workings of R. And this can lead to a few um, unexpected results as the base R functions aren't forward compatible necessarily. Because the um, underlying type of resources is character um, for the, the URIs, R will tend to dispatch on this basis for base functions or for other packages that aren't expecting these novel S3 vectors. This can be unexpected. The table function, for example, returns counts by URI, not label as we might expect. We deliberately have to, um, as character return the URI and not the label as it's the URI that's designed to represent the resource. You can of course tabulate the labels explicitly instead. More generally, um, LDF offers an escape hatch to convert a linked data frame back into a normal data frame, i.e. one not containing vectors of RDF resources using the as data frame of labels function. This converts all of the RDF resources into their labels. And I've not displayed it here, but there's a similar function that will take a data frame of URIs and then um, 
go and get labels from from Sparkle endpoints to, um, uh, to to label those identifiers. You can become unstuck in less obvious ways. The humble rbind function um, doesn't attempt to merge attributes. Um, so here we've got two data frames, and um, one of them describes URIs A and B. Um, uh, uh, with uh, some, some capitalized version of the labels and some just an arbitrary other uh, column. And then we've got another one here that does B and C. So you can see that there's, there's um, an overlap, but um, the union is, is actually three different, um, three different resources. And indeed, uh, between the two sets of rows, four different actual value, uh, rows. Um, and uh, Arbine just takes the description from the first table and not from the second. So the C resource is missing its label here. Um, so you need to use the more robust VEC Arbind function provided by the vectors package to ensure that the descriptions get combined. Um, likewise, um, the base merge function only retains the descriptions of the left-hand data frame, um, which is fine for left joins um, or inner joins, but for right joins or full joins, you'll need to use dplyr um, which uses vectors underneath. And we expose a merge description function to help outside of the tidy layer. So if the talk has aroused your interest, uh, you can come and check out the package on GitHub. And finally, here are some links if you'd like to know more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. This was very, very interesting. And, and I was burning not to ask, but yeah, I asked after all, I, I saw that you, you were using dplyr for querying, I guess, database. And I remember there was dbplyr as well. Is there a need ever to use dbplyr or dplyr takes care of that? Uh, yeah, so, that, so at the moment, the, the, the underlying storage is just in, in our data frames. So you don't even need D, dplyr at all. You can just use base R apart from those, those gotchas there. You'd have to do some um, maintenance of the vectors yourself if you're if you're manipulating them. Um, likewise, you could um, extend this to work with with dplyr if you wanted. The, the package doesn't um, prevent that as far as I'm aware. I haven't, I haven't actually tried it, but um, it's it's actually quite simple as a. Um, so I think it would probably be fine. Um, there's some other things that would be interesting to try that we've seen talked about over the last couple of days, like. Um, arrow uh, and parquet that, that might offer um, uh, other advantages too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't see any other question, but just I'm reminding kindly if you guys have questions in the audience, please don't be shy. Raise it in the QA tab. And with this, I want to thank again to Robin for a nice presentation. And our next uh, speaker is Hannes Muhlesen. And I'm sorry, Hannes, if I pronounced it wrong. With DuckDB and in process analytical DBMS. So, Hannes, please share your screen. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. And now you see the, the infinite. Uh, uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Very good. And you can hear me as well. So because I cannot see the uh, interface anymore now. Anyways, it's all good. It's uh, all good. Excellent. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. So um, I also we see, we see your presenter uh, mode. So I don't know if you want to share the presenter mode. Or oh, that's not the idea. Indeed. Hang on. I shall just I'll just unplug my external monitor then. Is this better? Yeah. All right. And you have to give me an audible, like a uh, like a warning with the one minute, because I will not be able to see the thing in, uh, either. All right, sure. I'll get started then. Um, so yeah, talk uh, is about DuckDB, uh, an in-process analytical database management. Uh, my name is uh, Hannes Mühleisen. It's a very German name. Uh, and I am the co-creator of DuckDB together with Mark Rasfeld. And I'm also the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, DuckDB Labs, a small artisanal database management systems company from Amsterdam. Um, I'm also a senior scientist at the CWI uh, Database Architectures Group, which um, you'll probably tell you that I like databases. Um, and uh, just as a small side note, uh, Python was invented at, at CWI um, 
but yet I'm here with the R crowd. Uh, because I quite like the um, the uh, use R as a conference. In fact, this is my fifth uh, use R. Uh, so uh, at DEF CON, I think you get uh, you get uh, sort of booze if you say that, but regrettably not at use R. Uh, I'm also a former duck parent here on the on the slide. You can see um, my uh, my little Wilbur, and this is also how the thing got its name. In case you're wondering, um, so a little bit of um, uh, how should I say? Uh, motivation. Uh, R and database management systems had a bit of a, I would say, troubled relationship. Uh, there's even this quote from Hadley, which says, if your data fits in memory, there is no advantage to putting it into a database. It will only be slower and more frustrating. And um, so this really hurt our feelings. And, um, and we thought, okay, challenge accepted. Let's actually think about how a database management system should look like that the um, people in you know statistical programming in the R community and elsewhere actually like. Um, so what do people actually do with you know bigger data sets in R? Um, well, it's actually quite surprising that the base R data frame is actually pretty good. I mean, it has a column R uh, data representation, uh, all these things you, sorry, I just have to switch my fan off because I think it's creating noise. Um, uh, it has columnar storage. Uh, it does bulk processing, which means that the operators stay, you know, the operating column at the time, very tight sort of C loop. So that's a good thing. But of course, it still has some, there were some some issues. Um, and then what we get, what we got is kind of the data frame plus plus um, collection of packages like deep layer, data table, disk frame, and so on and so forth. Um, and they provide usually, um, you know, better APIs, better performance, this kind of stuff. But of course, they are not really trying to be database management systems. They don't do query optimization. They don't really do compression. They don't do complex query languages. They don't do, you know, updates really, you know, they're transactional updates and things like that. So people have been defaulting to using uh, Apache Spark uh, a lot. And that actually doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that using Spark clusters with less than, let's say, 100 nodes makes absolutely no sense and is only a artifact of tooling uh, not being available. Um, and it would surprise you that MacBooks can actually run most practically relevant big data sort of tabular processing given that the right software uh, is installed on them. And you can actually expand the capabilities of single node into terabytes, you know, MacBooks as well. You can also get fairly monstrous VMs on, on Amazon these days. So um, yeah, we should probably use single node instead of, instead of going to Spark. Um, but there is some required ingredients here. And the main ingredient that we need to make this work is efficiency. So we do need automatic parallelization. We do need holistic query optimization. Um, it's important to, to be able to do out of core processing, which means that we should be able to use disk storage in order to um, uh, you know, offload uh, data that would otherwise um, you know, fill up memory. And it's also quite critical to be able to use compression both in storage and during query processing. It's quite, crit quite critical. So enter DuckDB. So what is DuckDB? Um, DuckDB is a new, fairly new, it's only four years old, um, in process OLAP DBMS, and there's a lot of acronym there. OLAP means online analytical processing, which means it's uh, you know geared towards analytics rather than trans transactions. Uh, it's a database management system. It's written in C++. It has extensive SQL support. Uh, it has transactional guarantees, the asset guarantees, uh, um, as they are known. Um, DuckDB is special also because it has zero external dependencies. You don't need to install any sort of crazy libraries in order to you know, build or install or use uh, DuckDB. Uh, it has a lot of APIs for various sort of runtimes like C, C++. Okay, that's pretty obvious if it's written in C++. But we also have a command line interface. We have Python and notably R integrations, Java, Node.js, Julia, you name it. There's a ton of those. Um, what is special about it that it has native support for the Parquet file format, which is a format that is used a lot to ship around large data sets. It is very well integrated with Apache Arrow to the point where you can read arrow structures uh, in queries and you can produce arrow structures as query results. Um, it's not just a prototype, it's actually quite bulletproof. We extensively, we run millions of queries on every commit to make sure it still works. Um, and it's free, it's free and open source. It is released under the very, very permissive MIT license. And our tagline is usually, we are the SQLite for analytics because people tend to know SQLite 
SQLite is a great system, but it's not meant for uh, analytics. DuckDB is trying to be the SQLite for analytics. Um, as I just mentioned, DuckDB is an OLAP system. It's meant for uh, analytical use cases, and that is characterized by workloads where you have large reads of data, complex queries, you know, like, like aggregations, joins. Um, so you don't have to do the, uh, the rect rectangularization of the data set, as mentioned earlier. Um, the queries that read large parts of the data, and also when your um, changes to the data, like um, insertions or uh, deletions or things like that, um, are um, also rather bulky, meaning they insert like a million rows at a time, or maybe just not one at a time. And the way DuckDB is fast is by using a, something called vectorized processing, which is a query processing paradigm that is specifically geared to be fast for OLAP queries. You know, that's why we picked it. And the way it works, it's trying to keep data that is needed by a query at any given time in the CPU cache, and that makes it uh, quite fast because the CPU cache, of course, is the fastest storage that you have. Of course, it doesn't mean that your uh, data for your query has to fit in the cache. It's just whatever, you know, uh, because the engine is streaming, but whatever is needed at a single point fits in cache. Um, and DuckDB actually loves R. This is, I think, the only database management system that was actually built with the R community um, because the motivation to build DuckDB came from the R community in the first place. So Thomas, Thomas Lumley, who is in R core, um, kind of started this whole, this whole uh, you know, journey many, many years ago. Um, we picked it up um, and then uh, working a lot with Anthony and Amico, who, um, who also had, su had suffered a lot you know, with our early attempts. Um, but uh, basically that triggered us building a database management system that, that would work well with statistical uh, programming like in R. Um, DuckDB is on CRAN and you can just do like install packages DuckDB. Uh, we have a new version 0.4.0 as of this week. It implements the DBI, so DBI is this standard database uh, API that R provides. Um, it also supports dbplyr. We just had a brief discussion on dbplyr. So dbplyr is the, the version of dplyr that can talk to databases. And what is special about DuckDB that is can very efficiently transfer data back and forth uh, from R. Um, and there's some interesting sort of things like around happened along the way, for example, um, Dealing with strings is, 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 is the strings in R can be a challenge if you're an external system and you know if you're talking to things like ClickHouse or Postgres, there's a lot of you know conversion going on. And we have actually demoed uh, you know a way around that in 2014 um, at DSC, which is sort of the subconference of USAR. Um, and then in 2016, uh, Gabe Becker proposed this Altrep framework, which then DuckDB now in 2021 actually uses to make string uh, string uh, transfer from from um, DuckDB to R fast. So this is kind of funny how, you know, sometimes you can actually change the environment. It just has to. It just take took eight years. So that's that's kind of the time frame that we're operating on here. Um, DuckDB also has some kind kind of interesting hacks uh, to make to make uh, interactions with R fast. So we have a direct scan operator. Um, so we can di DuckDB can directly read data frame objects from R without actually importing them, and that works because it's DuckDB runs in process. It runs in the same process that your R shell runs in. And that means it can just, you know, look at the pointer and read the data behind it. So there's no import required to run queries. I'll show that in a second. And then we still run into an issue with, uh, with, uh, with strings because those are tricky to parallelize the read off. And we, we managed to map them to something. DuckDB has this concept of an enum type, which is like a dictionary. And if you know that strings in R are globally duplicated, eliminated, um, you can actually make R strings look like a special case of the DuckDB enum type. And, uh, and then the pointer, actually, you can treat the pointer to the string as some sort of a dictionary entry pointer, and that works really well. And uh, the result is that you, we have a, a zero copy string read in, in DuckDB, and we can actually create string vectors in this new experimental thing um, directly without creating this MOOC, calling this MOOC string um, function. Um, now I just have to briefly check on time. How am I going to be doing on time? Uh, You're fine. You're fine. You? I'm good. Okay. So then I can show a, a brief demo. Um, now I just have to just have to set this up here. So can you see? Can is this readable for you? This R shell? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
So um, in my demo, I'm just going to run DuckDB and, and Postgres. So here I will just connect using DB. I will just connect to, to Postgres and DuckDB. I now have a connection to Postgres and I have a connection to DuckDB. Um, and let me just generate some data. Oops. Um, so if I, if you look at this data, this is just a bunch of numbers. Uh, doesn't really matter. It's just some random distributions. Um, and now let's just do um, import into database. It's pretty common, you know, you want to move your R data frame into a database. Let's just do that. And with Postgres, that takes a while because the Postgres is running on a separate process. It, it has to ship the data over the client protocol, which is requires serializing the data on the R side and deserializing it on the, on the Postgres side. And that just makes this fairly slow. So this took 12 seconds. If I then try to write the same data into DuckDB, it took 0 0.6 seconds. And this is just because uh, DuckDB runs in the same process um, and it's more efficient on in ingesting data. Now let's try the other way around. If I try to read the same data that I just wrote to Postgres back from Postgres into R, you know, how long is this gonna take? Um, and it's the same problem. Postgres has to serialize this data. R, the R client for Postgres has to deserialize it. So it's going to take a while, six seconds. Okay. And DuckDB, 0 0.1 seconds. So this is, you know, the kind of in, like back and forth speed that you can get if you're using a in-process analytical database management system. Um, and uh, yeah, so now, uh, now let's uh, look a bit at strings. So I mentioned strings earlier. Um, I'm just going to make a new table that uses a column from my example data set um, and creates a new table that has a string version of the of this column in both uh, DuckDB and Postgres. I'm just going to run this um, creation of the new table. Okay, so we're done. Obviously, didn't time this because it doesn't matter, but DuckDB is also much faster. So now if I transfer the strings back from Postgres, this again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't is, is not going to be able to use uh, any sort of crazy tricks in, in transferring string data. And so it takes eight seconds, even longer than the integer version of the data, even though it's only one column in the DuckDB, even though it's string data and it's generally challenging, it's still, still managed to finish this much, much faster. But I mentioned that you don't actually have to import into, into the database. So in DuckDB, what we can do is we can say DuckDB register. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just saying DuckDB, hey, DuckDB, here is this MT cars data frame that you all uh, know and love. Um, and just make this available as a table also called MT cars, right? And then I can run a query, like select star from MT cars, pretty simple. And I get this table back, which looks familiar, doesn't it? But the cool thing is I can, if I actually look at the query plan that DuckDB uses to run a query, like select this from MT cars where field is bigger than four, you will see that this is a plan where, okay, we have a projection that gets us the first column. We do a filter on the sill which is bigger than four, that's fine. But down here, we actually see that this is an R data frame scan, which means that we haven't actually imported the data in database, we just run the query straight on the data frame. And that's uh, really powerful because then, you know, there's actually no transfer, no creation of tables, no nothing. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's kind of DuckDB in a very, very sort of compressed form. Um, yeah, if you if you have, uh, you know, um, I know I know it's difficult to ask questions in this online forum, but I really would um, would love to hear from you if you have any questions. If you want to connect with us, uh, you know, elsewhere, we, we are DuckDB on Twitter. We have a Discord channel uh, that we that we are all uh, hanging out in. And um, yeah, now I'm I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, Hannes. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I have a question, Gar, if, if I may. Yes, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question, uh, two questions actually uh, uh, of interest for me. So do you support multiple uh, database uh, in the same instance of uh, DuckDB? And how, uh, do you support also uh, credentials? So uh, can we uh, connect uh, to DuckDB uh, as different users? Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of protocol also uh, you support to connect yeah. uh, to DuckDB? Uh, Do you support yeah. SSL uh, encryption and this kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah, so DuckDB is in process. So there's no protocol. There's also no you know, login. The database runs in the same process as your R. So yeah, it's, it's OK. So uh, OK, I mean, it's like SQLite so it's, in that sense. Uh, exactly. So OK, no, it's, uh, but it's very interesting. Um, OK. And you can have multiple. You can run as many DuckDB databases in a single process as you want. If you do, yeah. you know, people do. Some people run 10,000 DuckDB instances in a single process. It works perfectly well. OK, uh, thank you. Um, it's very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, thank you.
Um, there was a question in the chat, uh, the benchmarks, well, these are not really benchmarks. These are just like simple uh, examples. Uh, the question here is that the benchmarks are for a table with a specific, somebody else is sharing this slide, but okay. Um, the specific t shape and structure, how scores look like when we have more columns. Um, the, I would, I would uh, expect that, uh, no, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this really doesn't matter uh, in terms of, um, you know, the difference between Postgres in this case and DuckDB being uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, stark, uh, no matter what kind of columns and data types you have. Um, other Honestly, questions? If I may ask a question, uh, what's the physical sure. size? What was the physical size of DuckDB? I guess if I store some data in it, I, I, I might want to ship it outside. Yeah, I guess, is it big? Like, uh, yeah, with, with, let's say Postgres, or I don't know, or SQLite. You mean the binary? Yeah, I guess the binary. You mean file the database? Itself, the like, yeah. yes, yeah, the dark. You mean, but you you mean yeah. do you mean the, the, the you mean do you mean the software itself or the database that it uses? The database that it uses. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that of course depends on what data you insert. We do um, support compression, automatic compression of the data you store mm -hmm. in DuckDB. So if you you know if you store something like. Uh, I don't know, uh, only oh, only this like constant values, like something like this a billion times, it will of course not store the same value a billion times, it will compress. Um, we are we are working on, on expanding the capabilities there, but DuckDB should be fairly compact already uh, in terms of, you know, storage size. And we actually, I didn't mention this, have a single file database format. So the, all the data that you, that you insert in DuckDB into various tables is gonna be in a single file. So you can email that around. Uh, yeah, that's that's a feature that we've co copied from SQLite. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And the database, the binary itself is like 10 megabytes or something. It's fairly tiny. Uh, it's a single binary. There's no like other files. It's, a, it's just a, and yeah, you can just install the R package. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest. Okay. I don't see any other questions, but please, uh, yeah, uh, please keep uh, asking yeah. the QA tip if any questions, and also the resources that Han is sharing with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can just follow us on, on Twitter. That's the first step, I think. Thank you. Oh, there was one question. Uh, we have like 20 seconds or something. Uh, does it support concurrent access to the same DB? Ah. Uh, it does if uh, if everyone is in read only mode. If you can have as many concurrent readers as you want, but you can if you ha you can only have one write and then you cannot have other other readers. That is a is a limitation. It has to do with the um, yeah the the processing model and the, the way we store the catalogs and such. Thank you, thank you, Hannes, and thank you for the question. And with this, I want to thank again Hannes for an excellent presentation of that we did. And I want to thank you. invite, yes, thanks. thanks Hans. I want to invite Miguel Alvarez uh, with the database list against the metrics, use of text list and vague table for the assessment of vegetation plot data. Miguel, flo floor is yours, please. Thank you. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. And uh, how about the audio quality is still that bad? <laughs> It's a bit crackling, but it's audible. I can I can understand. Okay, then I try to speak now. Um, so if you can see my slides, thank you for uh, for the support and sorry for uh, these uh, technical issues. Um, I would like to have a brief introduction in these two packages called ta tax list and back table, which are de developed for the us. Uh, data in R. So I'm Miguel Alvarez and I'm an agronomy engineer, but I consider me rather as a botanist and geobotanist working in different um, uh, research projects in East Africa and uh, South America. So and uh, among the, the topics I handled, I also deal with uh, programming or R tools and uh, um, working with some vegetation plot databases. So when you collect, when we collect information in vegetation surveys, we used to collect uh, not only information on abundance and um, uh, presence of uh, species in, in a plot, in a physical plot, but uh, sometimes we also collect environmental variables uh, in the, uh, related to this plot and even some attributes of the species we uh, assess 
and uh, the results of these uh, surveys are usually uh, many different tables so it's a, a complex uh, data set which is not a, a, a possible to store in just one um, in one spreadsheet so that's the reason why we may need uh, the use of relational databases so and uh, if you look at uh, uh, to publications of uh, vegetation ecologists, you will find most of the time this uh, vegetation table display in this way, as in the left uh, side. So the list of species, sometimes the attributes of the species, and uh, on the top, the header with the information about the sampling plots, and in the table, uh, the abundance of these species in the plot. So if you like to analyze uh, uh, this uh, data in, in a um, statistical package, uh, then you need to uh, reshape uh, the table and and uh, most of the packages uh, will uh, accept the uh, tables where the, the plots are the rows and here in abbreviated names are the species and every species is a, is a column. So especially if you like to comp compare the species compositions between plots. So if you like to include information related with the, the environmental variables or uh, species attributes, then you have to uh, uh, handle that in separated tables. So for that, there is this uh, widespread uh, model, which is called, I will call it the three mat matrices model. So where the uh, uh, abundance of species in the plots is uh, stored in this uh, L matrix. And uh, we ha you have the R matrix with the environmental variables and the Q matrix with the species uh, trait. Model is not that useful when you uh, come to the storage of data, uh, because uh, uh, especially in this uh, L matrix, uh, you need uh, to uh, put the, uh, the species and the plot abundance as columns in order to uh, be able to link these uh, three uh, different tables. So this is uh, what you do when you store the data in a relational database, database schema. And um, I um, assume um, that this, uh, so no, this way of storage and even handling the data in this way uh, make uh, the system uh, more efficient in terms of storage, but I uh, adventure to say also more efficient in terms of uh, uh, statistical assessment. You also um, uh, avoid, you have a little chance of having redundancies in the data sets and the databases uh, surveil for the consistency of the information. Here, um, again, just a comparison. So the typical cross table with the relevance and the uh, um, a species here as columns, and here is the same table formatted in this column-oriented table. So the, the the one I call it cross table. So and um, as you see here, you have uh, a column for uh, the relevant, column for species, and a column for the abundance. The, what you can notice here in this cross table, you have a lot of zeros, which means are species that were not recorded in a plot, but you still need to put something in this uh, cross table, uh, which is not necessary to, to um, record here in this format. So any species uh, that is not observed in a plot, you don't put any entry. And that uh, makes uh, the difference in the um, data size. And I would I will say also in the data assessment. So I have uh, developed this package uh, back table to, um, in order to handle all this information of multiple tables in just one object and be able to process. Because if you like, for instance, to produce subsets of the data sets, you have to do the subsets in the single tables and that may be a nightmare. So, and I have to provide uh, also functions uh, to deal with this uh, 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 object structure. And uh, the main targets uh, or main motivation for this development is to, to make uh, the data portable. So I can share uh, data sets with other people by just sharing these um, objects. Uh, repeatability, because if I share the, the, the data and the, uh, and the script, for instance, everyone can repeat what I do. And uh, at the same time to, uh, enhance the collaboration, the collaborative assessment of the data. Here, um, uh, Backtable um, organized the, or structured the objects in uh, using S4 in R. So every uh, single table is um, a slot in this object. 
And so you can see here, the main slots are the species samples and headers indicated. There are some additional more that are more specific for vegetation ecologists. But uh, important to know is that those, uh, all those uh, slots are linked uh, like in a relational uh, database. <clears throat> and some of those objects are S4 objects itself, or some are data frames or lists. So, um, and just a brief uh, mention of uh, to the package uh, tax list, which is the um, package also uh, included in the R Open Science. Uh, this package um, structure also information, but on taxon and taxonomies. So the plant species that we record in the field, they are in a, they belong to a taxonomic structure, and it's also using those slots, um, which are data frames here. So you have a slot for all the taxa uh, information, so a slot for names, because some, for instance, some species may have like an accepted name and uh, synonyms, and the observations are usually linked to the names and the, through the names to the taxa. taxa. And uh, there is a, a slot for the uh, species attributes here and one to uh, document the uh, bibliographic source for the defining a species or a taxon. So um, just an advice uh, here is the link, uh, which is also in the summary of this presentation, where is a more extended session uh, dealing with this kind of objects. So um, uh, what, uh, what I forgot, the text object is the one which is uh, meant here in this slot called species. Here is just an example. So I put in gray uh, the, the quote I used to produce the graphic, which I won't, I won't like to discuss, but uh, uh, there is a, a function in Backtable which is used for count taxa. So if you like to count the species, this uh, counting species is not trivial. So if you have two plots and each plot has 10 species uh, recorded there, the sum of the two plots uh, doesn't uh, uh, need to be 20. Maybe it's just 10 because the, the, all the species are shared between the plot. And so uh, because of that, uh, um, I designed this, uh, I defined this function. So in this function, I use a formula telling me I like to calculate the, the number of species per releve. And the object is called releve. There is a suff suffix I put to the calculated uh, variable just to remember later uh, that I, I calculated that uh, by counting. Uh, included lower is, uh, is um, a parameter which will control uh, the fact that uh, sometimes uh, botanists will uh, record uh, taxa in a lower resolution than species. So if you have a variety or sub subspecies, by just counting species, they won't be considered. So, but if you say include the lower uh, ranks, that means those uh, subspecific ranks have to be aggregated to the species level and then counted. So, an in header means uh, I won't get a data frame with the results, but I will insert a new variable in the slot header in this object. That is the reason why I assign the result of this uh, function into the same object and I can, I can collect uh, the, these calculations in the input object during a session. So here you see the, the histogram of the count, count of a species per plot and the mean value me indicates uh, that around nine species uh, per plot are found there. But you see also uh, variability. So there are some functions uh, for calculating more advanced uh, diversity indices, like the Shannon index, which is considering not only the number of species you count in a plot, but also the distribution of uh, abundance. So if you have uh, five species in a plot, but in this plot, one species is dominating, this is considered like uh, less uh, diverse than a plot where all the species have the same abundance. So they share this uh, even distribution. So, and uh, here I use, again, the object. Um, there is a variable in the slot samples, which is called cover percentage, which is the measurement of abundance of the species in the plot. The Shannon function is defined in back table as well. And here, again, this in header indicating I will insert this new variable in, in the header of the uh, data set. So, um, and here I, comp I just compare 
the count of species with the Shannon index, just to indicate that the plots that have the same number of species may not have the same diversity when you account for the uh, distribution of abundances. You have uh, some variability at the same level. So, um, and uh, finally, um, uh, I like to show um, some functions that will use the species attributes and calculate uh, from the species attribute um, statistics at the plot level, like uh, here, just to mention that this uh, share, uh, object that you will uh, be able to download. Also, if you look at the session, um, is uh, uh, considering also in the slot taxon traits of the slot species, um, some of those attributes of the species, like the life form is, uh, uh, in that case, you have 17 species, which are annual herbs, uh, 51, perennial herbs, one climber, and four uh, woody species. Here, there is another um, variable, another attribute, which can be considered as a uh, numeric. So the first is, uh, is a categorical one. I will just uh, show the categorical one. So in that case, uh, I used uh, the function trade proportion, also defined by back table. And um, uh, I, used, uh, I put here the object is relevance again, the back table object. Uh, the trait is called life form, as uh, you said, uh, you saw. Uh, Releve ID is uh, where I like to aggregate the uh, statistics, um, include NAs. Uh, false means if a species doesn't have any information, the cover of this species won't be considered in the total cover of the plot, which is used to calculate the relative proportion. And um, weight is the cover percentage, as used before. I put also a suffix to recognize uh, this variable in the header, and I say in the header true. And so um, this uh, function will generate a statistic, a proportion of every single level of uh, life form in the header of the uh, back table object. So and you see here, as suspected, so if you have plots where the perennial plants dominate, you don't have a space for annual plants, and uh, the vice versa, if you have plots dominated by annual species, species you don't have any perennial there. So, so if you don't know exactly how is the name of the, of the, of the variables you, you need to use for trade, head var, and the uh, um, weight. So you can look at here, of course, for the traits, you, you need a, a categorical variable. Uh, the head variable will most of the time, the relevant re ID, because uh, we like to compare between relevance and uh, the weight uh, have to be the variable that account for the abundance of a species in the plot. So, um, well, um, I, my opinion, uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, functions and, uh, and this object, which is uh, um, focusing uh, on vegetation surveys, uh, is also possible or suitable to assess other kind of diversity um, um, data. So you may have even uh, from uh, animal communities, for instance, or other organisms and uh, different kinds of uh, assessment of uh, diversity may also be possible to be accommodated in this object uh, and uh, use the functions for some uh, calculations, uh, some statistics. Um, there are further applications I didn't show because of the time, like uh, you can export also cross tables because most of the statistical packages will require this uh, format. Uh, there are also some import export routines and uh, yeah. There are some some uh, some uh, duties to do. So, like uh, considering vegetation layers. If you work in forest, for instance, you make uh, lay, uh, you may use layers. But I don't have uh, designed any functions to work with this kind of information. With syntaxonomies, which is a new feature here, uh, there are no functions at the moment. And uh, maybe something that could be interesting is to use the environmental information and to try to uh, import this information into the uh, attributes of the species because some studies may focus on the species rather uh, than on the plots and this, um, yeah um, spatial information is not explicitly considered here so, and uh, with this i thank you for, again for the help and now and uh, for the attention to those who attended these presentations and if you have some special questions or inquiries uh, this is the place where you can find me thank you Thank you so much, Miguel. This was great. I guess uh, yeah, it's nice to conclude with 
very nice botanical garden <laughs> and a very nice solution that you came up with. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any questions in QA, but I guess yeah, you can uh, touch base with Miguel as, as he provided his contact. And with this, yeah, I want to thank again our great speakers and the audience for a very nice session about data crunching with R. And this will conclude the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Edgar.